Hi, Jan. Hi. It's good to see you here in Hamburg. And this gives us the opportunity to talk about your career, your work, and about your books and about chess training in general. But maybe we should start at the beginning. When and how did you learn to play chess? Yeah, uh, first of all, uh, hi, and hi. I, um, I'm glad to be here and I'm thankful to all the people who are, who are watching this. Well, I started chess, uh, playing chess when I was like six and a fun fact is that my uh, sister taught me. Like Bobby Fischer. Uh, yeah, in a way. But Same age. Also his sister? Yeah, basically. But she's not playing at all. Uh, she just uh, told me the rules and that was it. And how did things continue? I mean, uh, do you remember how she taught you when you first saw the chessboard that you had a certain feeling or that you were fascinated by the game or anything? That yeah, well, uh, when I was around eight, uh, still football was my favorite sport. But that changed quickly because I was quite uh, um, quite able to run quickly. But when I was at the ball, I, I couldn't, I, I didn't know what to do. I mean, you know, so I always messed up. So uh, that didn't work for me. Uh, but when I was like nine, 10, I was already, you know, reading chess books, uh, quite fascinated in, in the game. I was playing, uh, yeah, various tournaments, even like championships and so on. Um, I started to be quite good quite early, uh, which ended up in uh, in such a situation that I just was older, uh, always with some older company, you know, playing leagues and so on. So that was a specific thing. Yeah, all my uh, classmates went for um, a week out in the nature together, and I went for a chess tournament with you know thirty year old guys and so on. That was uh, uh, interesting. But yeah, uh, I always had this passion for the game. Uh, I, uh, for example, we had like several chess boards around the flat and I was moving from one to another. In your parents' flat? In my parents' flat, yeah, obviously. You had, so your parents were also chess players? Yeah, my, my, my father uh, is relatively good chess player, yeah. Oh, but how come your sister taught you the rules and not your father? Uh, it just, was just an accident. She was around when I was asking, perhaps. Uh. And reading chess books, studying chess books, the chess books were also around or did you buy them or did your father say you should study chess books? Or? Well, look, my, my father's <coughs> rating is about 2000, uh, so he's quite good. And mm -hmm. yeah, he had um, several dozens of chess books, uh, mostly of, of uh, you know, Slovak and Czech authors. And some of them were quite good. So yeah, I went to them and it was fascinating. Any favorite, any favorite book from that period? Well, from that period, um, yeah, w there is quite a famous Czech author which is called Ludwig Pachmann. Oh, yeah, of course, Pachmann. Yeah, and yeah, he, in Germany, everyone knows. Pachmann, everyone yeah. knows because he he was he, he he had this didactic talent, you know. Yeah. So he has uh, published this this tactical books and the strategical books, and we had them all. By the way, he was quite active also in the anti-communist movement, so he was like a very interesting personality. Yeah, after he had been very active in the communist movement, uh, that's what I heard. Well, look, uh, uh, people get wiser. Uh, that's <laughs> quite <laughs> that's quite normal. So uh, that's no, fine with me. Yeah, and I, think I don't want to discuss politics, but. I heard that Pachmann was an interesting and very controversial figure. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. But uh, a brilliant chess author, yeah. and yeah, uh, we and also very prolific. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 all as well. Yeah, and I had some Alihin's games, I think, from Kotov. Uh, oh. That was also uh, beautiful, and yeah, the, some other, you know. Uh, well, what is <laughs> quite interesting, or what was quite interesting, that in in the eighties and in the nineties. Uh, there were like two books that were uh, published in very huge amounts in Slovakia. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, like Fight for the Chess Crown from one Slovak author, uh, Mr. Kozma, I think. And then uh, The Test of Time from Kasparov. Oh. Yeah. So when you went to any tournament, 
that, that there were like so many of copies that every chess um, you know uh, chess club had like 20 50 of them oh. so that was the typical price so i had like five times test of time and, <laughs> and so on so i studied those those two books as well so you studied test of time kasparov and and even even as a very young player yeah yeah when i was 10 or 11 or so yeah exactly and did you have the feeling that you understood what he was writing no, about no not at all <laughs> not at all i mean uh, it's very heavy in, with lines i like the games i went through some of the lines but i think that the commentary actually is uh, virtually non-existent yeah he, he uh, like for example karpov's uh, memorable games like yeah. from 75 85 are much better prose than yeah. than this one definitely yeah. Yeah, I mean, I remember when I was already a pretty strong player when I started to 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 read the books by Kasparov and, well, I didn't really get into them. They were too dense and, you know, so I was wondering, you know, you as a junior, well, as a young player, that studying this. Well, I, I, I was adoring Kasparov, of course, but it was a bit difficult for me. But, for example, I quite liked uh, the predecessors. I think that that yeah. are quite good. I mean... Yeah. A lot of good work, uh, and also the, the the commentaries are, and the annotations are quite okay, I think. And very comprehensive, the oh, whole of exactly. the whole chess chess history, and and that's yeah, <clears throat> all the famous games, and you know, analyzed in depth. So yeah, that's changing the evaluation at times yeah. Yeah. of of these old masters. Yeah, did you study all of them with the predecessors? Yeah, surely I did. Yes, from all five volumes. I, I, yeah, well, I had my hands on all five volumes. I, 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 I wouldn't say I have, you know, uh, checked every single game or so, but definitely I, I, I had uh, spent a lot of time with all of them, yeah. Oh, impressive. So, but back to your junior years, I read that you became Slovak champion under 12, under 14, and under 16. And in 2000, you also became European youth champion under 16. How do you explain these successes? Well, that was uh, actually uh, in 2000. I was the, I played like two tournaments. One of was this European championship, championship which I won, yeah. and then I played the the Slovak men championship which I won as well. Yeah, so that was like a double. That was oh. quite quite interesting. And this was the first time you became Slovakian champion? Yeah, yes, but I was like 15, uh, but uh, that was adult championship. Right? Yeah, 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 I, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So that was quite <laughs> nice. Uh, of course, the, the, the very best where I'm playing there, but still I was like seeded, I don't know, 20. And, and that, was, that was nice, yeah. So, I don't know, you know, sometimes it clicks. I mean, uh, sometimes uh, you are struggling with the game and not improving for a long time and then somehow something happens and and, and something just something happens yeah you yeah what my my i had a friend at the times uh roman hitilek maybe mm -hmm. you know him he was the uh one of, he is the one of the best correspondence players in the world uh -huh. so he was number one for several years and so on and he said that, Jan, you have been exchanged by aliens, you know, so <laughs> <laughs> that they just abducted me and brought me with some other. Yeah. yeah. So, so that was the feeling uh, I had as well at that summer, 2000. Yeah. And how did you react to this success, becoming European junior champion and Slovak champion? Did you think, well, I'm the greatest or... Were you just happy and did you think I might pursue a chess career? Or? Well, I was very happy about that. Uh, mm. I, as a young person, was uh, quite unpractical. Yeah? So yeah. I wasn't like thinking in like, yeah. how, where do I see myself in five years or ten years? You know, the, all these stupid questions you might get on uh, some interview uh, uh, when you are applying for a new job. I, I wasn't thinking in those categories. Yeah. I was like pretty much fascinated with the game. Uh, I didn't have, for example, any kind of uh, fixed training schedule or something like that. I just had my books and, um, well, I had did obviously have a coach, but I was just working when I felt like it, when I didn't feel like working on chess, I didn't work, and um, it just worked for me. And But you often felt like it. I don't know, um, I was 
I, surely I wasn't spending like four hours a day. Yeah, but you enjoyed the game, and you played it. I did. It, yeah, you played yeah, it with I still passion. enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, I think the passion is is something what is quite underestimated when we are speaking about you know the entire chess business. You have to like it. Like all the best players in the world, they really like the game. That's maybe the the the, the most distinct feature of them. I think they like the game, and well, you are working as a coach. Is there any way to 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 kindle this this passion or to rekindle it someone someone loses his or her passion oh, well sure sure there is i think yeah well the important thing is that you have to have a good relationship with your pupils right that you yeah. don't uh, have to torture them too much or so <laughs> you know, and they have to respect you you have to respect them you have to know them what they like what they don't like and so on that's one thing and then um, there should be some balance between the, um, the the practical and the difficult stuff and exercising and so on. And then you have this, you know, um, uh, the <coughs> funny part, uh, the the amazing part of, uh, in chess, the the little jokes, the the blitz games, and all of that. And I don't think you should uh, like totally suppress this 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 enjoyable funny part in order to get more time for, you know, uh, another bunch of exercises. And game, and game theory. For example. Because yeah. then you will just, you know, uh, uh, suppress the, the flame uh, of passion and, yeah, that's the end of career quite often, especially for young people. Yeah. And how, I mean, what would you recommend players who, as juniors, were quite passionate about the game, but then... And even were serious about the game, but then suddenly when they get older, they somehow lose interest and do not want to play anymore or feel they lose their interest in chess and chess becomes stale and boring. What would you recommend then? Is there any way to find, 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 find back to passion? Well, the question is whether, whether uh, they want to come back. I mean, yeah. it's there are like many fascinating things in life you can do instead of playing chess. So that's fine with me if someone says, okay, I've had enough and I want to, uh, I don't know, paint or, you know, learn how to cook or whatever, meet, yeah. meet with friends. But uh, if uh, someone just likes the game, but sti yet feels that he has become a bit rusty and that it's like boring and so on, mm -hmm. um, do what you like in chess. Yeah, that would be my advice. Yeah, you want to try new things, like learn King's Gambit. Yeah, why not? I mean, you might lose a few games, but you will get an, a different perspective. Yeah? So it's not this Dvoretsky approach that you have to work on your weaknesses and uh, then get better. It's just but that's like... good for professionals, of course. But yeah. when you are like Family Guy, you know, you have your your proper job, and then you go to to play for several times a year. <coughs> uh, it would be strange to, to, to want from, from such a person all the things you want from a professional, you know. I mean, first of all, you have to enjoy it. I mean, Yeah, but I think the Dvoretsky approach is just a general approach. You have weaknesses and you should work on them, irrespective whether you are an amateur or a grandmaster. The very idea that you have to be universal and that you have to, well, that it's just part of chess to improve yourself and to get better and to be a rounded player. You wouldn't agree to that for amateurs? Uh, well, if they want to improve, yes. If they don't want to improve, and that's also fine with me, they're not. I mean, you can just enjoy chess and just play them. But okay, base, if we say, yes, you wa uh, I want to improve, and that's, mm -hmm. that's my goal, then of course you have to work on your weaknesses, but you have to work on your strengths as well. Like being a strong tactician player, you can be become an even better tactician player. And sometimes working on your strength is more enjoyable than working on your weaknesses because you are on your own territory. So that's also an interesting thing. Yeah. And it's also less humiliating, yeah? <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> well, people would argue that uh, you have weaknesses and then the humiliation comes because you lose game after game because, well, you don't work on your weaknesses. <sighs> That might, I think you, you might combine both. I mean, you might combine both, yeah. Because, for example, if you just, uh, if, if you have a, you, if you are a middle aged guy who uh, doesn't know anything about, I don't know, rook end games, uh, 
should you really like spend half a year learning Rugend games? I doubt that. Yeah, uh, in the at the end you would be just totally exhausted and hate the game. So you have to combine it somehow with something pleasant, right? Maybe. But what I find interesting <laughs> is that the idea of improvement, self improvement, if you may say, so is so big in chess. I mean, you get books with titles how to improve. You know. Uh, seven ways to chess improvement and on and on and on. It seems to be just that it seems to be so difficult for chess player to just enjoy and say I enjoy chess on the level I play. You know, it just always seems to be the idea that you have to improve all the time. You know, that's not enough. That's not enough where you are at the moment. You yeah? know, it's just well, improvement, yeah? and you have to train and you have to work hard on it you know, just to improve your game. And as far as I understand you, Jörn, you would not entirely agree to that. No, I mean, enjoying chess more is also kind of improvement, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> because you get more from the game, right? So, yeah. So, yeah, no, I, uh, the, the, the sad truth is that most of the chess players don't improve. Yeah, yeah. they don't improve. Most of, all the most of chess players don't improve because, you know, you have your daily job, you have your other duties, you have limited time, you are exhausted when you come to the tournament and so on. And just having this, uh, this kind of imperative that you should improve will just make you nervous and, you know, uh, yeah. don't feel so well and don't enjoy it so much. So, like, for me, it's quite fine. Well, I'm a coach, you know, I'm yeah. selling my abilities to... Uh, to teach someone how to improve. Exactly. Uh, so I'm like saying something which is against myself. But uh, well, but but could also argue you sell your abilities to help people enjoy the game more. Sure, sure. Yeah. Like I have pupils that uh, they know that they are not improving. I know that they are not improving. But we are just having nice time together. <laughs> That's also some kind of value. And how does success enjoy, uh, success and joy of chess and passion for chess go together? I mean, because, well, um, I think if you are successful, very often success takes over. You want to, you want to feel, you want to feel again. You know this, this, this success. You know the the pleasure of success, and suddenly you focus on success, and you forget about the joy of chess. You know, mm -hmm. how does that go together? Well, it's difficult for me to answer that generally, but I can answer on my sto own story. Yeah? Yeah. I Please. almost stopped playing chess. Yeah, I, I almost don't play myself. And I find the enjoyment from the game by you know, explaining, writing articles about chess, uh, writing books about chess, coaching and so on, because I just feel that's a different way of uh, you know, sharing the, uh, the amazement about the game. Yeah. Like when you are... Coaching someone else, uh, you don't get into this kind of egoistical trap yeah. that I have to be better and so on. Mm. I mean, yeah, <clears throat> I know that I will never be the, you know, in the top 10 in the world. Uh, I know that I know something about chess and okay, that's just about right. But you were, you were, you were quite an active player during, when you played. And don't you miss this, you know, this feeling, this excitement when you sit down and you wonder did my opening preparation work what will he play and will I be able to beat him and of course you know I personally I think there's hardly anything as pleasant as winning a chess game I have to say uh, well um, I mm. didn't play during the pandemic yeah many people didn't play during the pandemic you not simple. even online well, I did play some Blitz games or so, but I, maybe I played one tournament online. Yeah. Like That was like partly serious, let's yeah. say. And I found out that I don't miss it. Yeah. So, because there's like a like lot of, um, you know, traveling, uh, a lot of stress connected to, for example, you, you are playing a league game somewhere, you have to travel there several hours, then you are sitting at the hotel alone, trying to uh, to out-prepare your opponent. Then you play, you find out that you are out-prepared, so you are just you know, sitting there uh, defending some verse end game for another five hours, and then you go home. So sometimes it's not that pleasant. I you mean, really need a lot of passion to do that. <laughs> well, uh, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. But... You played in different leagues. You, I think you played in the German league. You played for Slovakia 
obviously you played in the Spanish league and I suppose you you back then it was enjoyable. Yeah, well, it was a part of like how to make a living and it was enjoyable as well sometimes. Yeah. Traveling and seeing Sometimes it places. was too much. I mean, when yeah. I was playing in Budapest uh, on Saturday and in Hamburg on Sunday, oh. that was a bit too much, but yeah. well, okay, well. Yeah. Okay. Um, but back to training. You, you, you said you had a trainer? Yes. Um, who, who influenced you? Who was your trainer when you well, were I, young? And I, I, I did have like several trainers, several trainers, but the most important was Lubomir Vtachnik, the Slovak yeah. grandmaster. Oh, okay. And as a coach yourself, do you need to have a trainer? Or is it possible to realize your potential without a trainer? I mean, after all, today, especially today, there's lots of chess material available, books, videos, courses, everything. Do I need to have a trainer? Well, if you are an ambitious player and you want to improve uh, effectively, yeah. it's a good idea to have a trainer. Yeah, Because uh, you might have a chess program that shows you uh, the, uh, the correct answer in every given position. Yes. You might have a lot of books, but the tr what the coach does for you is that he or she uh, generaliz they makes generalizations yeah, of your own play. So he or she sees that, for example, you know, you are overestimating something. It, it sees your, your play, can see the, the, the difficult mm. spots, can... An outside view. Yeah, gives you an outside view, uh, might uh, focus your attention to important things, uh, structure the way how you work. Yeah? If your uh, coach doesn't do this for you, for example, if you have a coach and the coach has some lessons and goes ABC with every pupil, the mm -hmm. same lessons, doesn't look at the games of the pupil and so on, then I would say, yes, you can have a book instead. Mm -hmm. It's much cheaper. So, so the coach has to be able to, to focus on you as an individual. And, uh, uh, that's the, the most important thing, yeah? That's, yeah? That the coach needs to have a relationship with you, has to know you, has to know your per chess personality, uh, yeah, has to know how to sparkle your interest, how to push you into, for example, uh, courageous decisions aboard, and so on and so on. So without this personal uh, approach, coaching is useless. And Fatachnik did that for you? Uh, well... Uh, or was it just his strength, you know, as a grandmaster, that he taught you how to play and improved your play? Well, uh, 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 Lubomir Vtachnik wasn't probably one of the best, he, he was not one of the best psychological, psychological persons in the, you know, among the coaches, uh, but still he was a very strong players, uh, player and uh, still is. And he liked us, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, we were like several guys uh, uh, working with him and he just wanted to uh, to show us the beauty of chess, and that's also important. Yeah, mm -hmm. for example, I never paid him any uh, a single euro. Yeah, he just decided to for free. coach us for free because he just felt that oh. that's a you know good thing to do. Oh, good. Yeah. So yeah. so like he helped us immensely. I, I oh. would say. Oh. Okay, but you did then not. I mean, despite your successes as a junior player. You did not pursue a career as a chess professional, but you studied instead. And you studied philosophy and theology. And when I read this, I was wondering how does the spiritual, the spiritual aspect of theology go together with a more logical, rational uh, world of chess? Well, is, is chess so rational? Well, <laughs> <laughs> it has the reputation of being a rational game. That well, it just logic. Of, of course, you're right. It is not rational, and it's, our decisions are influenced by on the chessboard and outside the chessboard by a lot of irrational stuff. But in theory, it's a very rational, rational game. I think. Yeah. Look, I mean, uh, uh, many scientists uh, are. Uh, believers, yeah, the, uh, believing in God. Uh, for example, Albert Einstein he was, was a believer. I think so, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, these are quite different realms, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not uh, a prac. Uh, I, I wouldn't describe myself as a Christian today, yeah. yeah? So, that's a different 
thing as well. That's uh, studying theology and being an active Christian. Yeah. There are also two different worlds, right? So, um, because... But I, I just, sorry to interrupt you, but I think from my experience, people who study theology, they, they have a deep interest in religion and very often sure, they are sure. pra practicing... Some kind of spiritual path, right? Some kind of following yeah. some kind of spiritual path. Yeah, sure, yeah. sure, sure. Uh, I mean, um, it's like difficult for me to answer this one because uh, I don't feel the tangent too much, yeah? Because you, like, for example, is, uh, uh, does, uh, I don't know, chess and love go together? <laughs> because chess is rational, love is irrational. Well, question, of course yeah. they do, because yeah. ch uh, humans are complex beings. And That's as you say, I mean, you to play chess well and enjoyable, you need to have a passion for chess, which for yeah. some people is totally irrational. Sure. Yeah. So, so I don't see the contradiction. So it's difficult for me to answer because I just think that, for example, look, I'm not just a, a studied uh, theologian and a chess player, but I also like to cook, for example. Yeah, I like to cook. I have kids, I have a passion for uh, Japanese poetry and so on. Like People are complex and they do different things and they're just fine, I mean. Yeah. Okay, but what, what made you choose theology and philosophy? Uh, well, I was quite a good chess player at that moment, so I knew that I'm having some kind of you know uh, income if I need. So I just wanted to do something. Uh, I wanted to know how the world works, you know. So I went for the uh, impractical uh, stuff just to, you know, to 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 read the 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 all the giants of thinking of the past and uh, learn Latin and Hebrew and so. Uh, I shouldn't explain this to you. Uh, you, you have done literature, right? So I it's the same literature, thing. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so yes. this. But but I studied literature, and very often when studying literature, and as my parents and other people said, "Why do you study this? This is you know, it's it doesn't make much sense. You won't." Or they were just I mean, the basic thing was, "So you study literature, fine, but what do you want to work?" Afterwards, you know, when you when this nonsense is over, you know, why don't you think about a serious, yeah. serious uh, job, you know, and what can you ever do with literature, you know, studying literature? And I have to say, personally, it was just like, I mean, my two greatest passions, you know, playing chess and studying literature. Sometimes I feel they are absolutely useless. It's just, you know, for pleasure, and it's not, well, it's not something where you contribute something directly to to whatever, you know. So it's more yeah, my personal personal interest, personal passion, personal joy. But I have such a small theory, right? Uh, which I would like to 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 to, uh, to tell you. Like you have practical stuff in life and you have impractical <laughs> stuff in life, yeah. right? Which one is more important? Of course the impractical stuff, yeah, because you do the practical things to be able to do the impractical ones, yeah? So, for example, you earn money, you pay your checks and your rent, you wash your dishes and so on, all this practical stuff, to be able to be with your family, to go for a walk, to play chess and so on. So I don't think we should feel um, uh, somehow, uh, you know, guilty because we are devoting our time to impractical stuff. That's what we should do. That's what humans are supposed to do. But very often it's just like the impractical takes the impractical impractical side takes over. You know, you focus on chess and you're not able to drive a car or to repair something in the household and whatever. You know, it's just in Germany we say you have your heads in the your head in the clouds. You know, you're focused on chess or literature and you forget everything about everything else. You know, and the way you describe it, it's just. The practical is the basis, the foundation for the impractical stuff. But people who have a you know, fond of impractical things, very often, my observation, they do not have this basis, or this basis, this foundation is incomplete, you know? Well, that's, that's possible, but okay, well, then, uh, uh, yeah, but, but when, the, when the basis works, yeah. I think it's quite fine to, it's to quite do fine. the other things, yeah. 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 And you, Followed this with a passion, so you studied intensively and, you know, with with energy and rigor. Well, in, in the first years, yes. <laughs> oh. In the in the in the <laughs> last years, it was a bit difficult because you know, 
studying uh, theology and philosophy means that we are reading reading texts and writing about texts. Yeah. And that's something, well, uh, it's interesting, but five years is quite a lot of time yeah. in your life. So, so when I was in my fifth grade and so on, I was uh, envying, you know, doctors and other, uh, uh, other um, professions that they are other students that are actually, you know, putting their hands on something real. Mm -hmm. I mean, while uh, I was playing, uh, I was writing on Hume and Heidegger and, you know. Uh, so, but <laughs> did you have any, any special interest in philosophy, philosophy and theology? Like you mentioned Heidegger, any other philosophers? Like which 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 part of philosophy I like? Yeah, I mean, where you specialized and where you wrote your well, your, um, your final thesis about, or yeah, well, I I did write my final thesis on Buddhism. On uh, Buddhism. Yeah, on the, on on the transplantation of Buddhism to the West, like uh, how what did change and what didn't change, and so on, in the in the uh, Buddhistic tradition. And yeah, uh, when it comes to philosophy, I'm quite keen on uh, phenomenology uh -huh. and uh, especially now on echo phenomenology. So uh, how, how does the phenomenological approach to problems help us to deal, for example, with the climate crisis? So that's something what I'm uh, quite interested in now. Yeah. And but, but let me ask about this, this Buddhism thing. So... What did you find out when, when and how did Buddhism transfer from the East to the West? Well, that wasn't the, the topic of the thesis. That's quite a clear, like, oh. how, how did this happen? I was rather, um, well, I was doing a survey about what people think uh, Buddhism is, uh, the Westerners, and how do they, you know, practice in the West. And I was comparing it with, with Thai forest Buddhism and, and oh. Tibetan tradition and so on. Oh. And what I found really funny, I don't want to get into details, this is a chess <laughs> interview, but uh, <laughs> quite often uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the lay persons in, in, in the West, they were just copying their ideas about Christianity on a new religion. Really? Yeah. So, for example, they expected that Dalai Lama is some kind of a new, uh, uh, of a Buddhist pope, you know, yeah. with the same, uh, same duties and same stuff. Uh, they were expecting uh, to find in Buddhism the same structure of guilt and redemption, uh, the same structure of soul and so on. And yeah, this is not the case, of course. Or, for example, or maybe the best example is that they were putting uh, e equi equality mark between uh, prayer and meditation, yes. yeah, which is like a completely different thing. Yeah. So that was interesting, that, that, uh, that you cannot get, get rid of your culture completely, yeah, that's although very interesting. when you are trying, yeah, so <laughs> that was funny. Yeah, you try to do something new to get rid of your old, old tradition, you know, Christian tradition, this is old, and then... You, yeah, you, you, you reproduce. You it. enter in in in, a, uh, in some flow of Buddhism. You want to be absolutely free of uh, any influences to be a new person, and then you just you know copy the Christianity into it. And what I find, I mean, especially ironic that Buddhism well, has this idea of non-attachment, and you you are very very attached to to your old structures without realizing yeah. it. You know, and there is yeah. a lot of attachment in at Buddhist centers. I would say. As everywhere else, I mean, you know. <laughs> they are just humans, I suppose. You yeah, know? yeah. But theoretically, are. there's like this idea of sure, non attachment, sure, 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 you know. Sure, And some people yeah. are good at it, but. Some people are good at it, you know. That's most, why. Most are not, I mean. <laughs> isn't that why they practice, yeah. <laughs> but back to chess and your chess career. <laughs> did, studying, did studying help or hinder your chess career? Well, I didn't have a chess career. But I mean, now you have a chess career. No, I, I, well, uh, uh, let's make this clear. I mean, chess career for me is that you have a guy who just wants to improve and be as best as possible. And this is like, he puts it on the first, uh, f as, the, as the most important thing in, yeah. in, in his, at least professional life, right? Yeah. I didn't have this an, at any point of my life. I was just playing chess because it's, uh, uh, it was a way of earning money and it was like quite enjoyable, but I never, you know, tried to be... But nowadays, uh, okay, one can argue about the term chess professional, but from the outside, you're, you're a grandmaster, you're a chess author, and you're a chess teacher, you're a coach, and so on a very basic level, 
you earn your money with chess, and this, in my mind, to my mind, would qualify as a chess professional. Yeah. Especially as you're a grandmaster, you're a strong uh, player. I earn about, I don't know, one third of my money with chess. Only one third? Mm -hmm. What else do you do? Well, I, um, 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 I'm lecturing uh, soft skills for companies. Yeah. And I'm a writer, a non chess writer. A non chess writer. Yes. And uh, yeah, uh, that's basically what I do most of the time. Uh, so. You, so you're kind of coach teaching soft skills for yeah lecturer let's say lecturer or coach or whatever you uh, how how you want to call it I mean, and how does that work in practice? Do people call you and say can you give a lecture or well I have some uh, like um, <coughs> I'm, I'm working independently so mm -hmm. sometimes uh, um, uh, a, a company just calls and says okay we have this event we would like. Uh, keynote speech or mm -hmm. we would like uh, uh, um, to have a workshop for uh, for our um, uh, management or whatever that is so that's part uh, partially they're asking me like uh, directly and then I have like some companies which are offering these types of courses and workshops and speeches to to other co to, to companies and uh, when they get uh, when there is an opportunity window they just call me do you have time and they uh -huh. you know and how did you how did you get into that <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> <laughs> it happened <laughs> well i wrote i wrote some books so so that uh, that's something what uh, uh, has helped me to become known let's say yeah. and yeah and being a chess um, grandmaster also helps well, you know, because you look like a brainiac or some, <laughs> something. <yeah. laughs> but, People, <laughs> but you just excuse me, but again, you know, you know, letting spreading prejudices around. But a chess grandmaster wouldn't be my first address, the first go-to guy for soft skills. Well, uh, yeah. So for some, not for some, yes. I mean, uh -huh. <laughs> you know. Okay. Uh, no, uh, but okay. Well, generally. Generally, uh, you know, uh, companies do a lot of workshops, and yeah. conferences, and so on. Uh, there are not so many people that uh, can bring some new, fresh, you know, insights. Uh -huh. There are some professionals that are doing this all, all the time, but you get always the same thing from them, basically. Yeah. So quite often, these huge companies are trying to improvise. And they want, I don't know, they, they, they want to call a high care who was at the Mount Everest. Because yeah. that's something what you can sell to the employees and s tell them you will meet such a person. Yeah, a, and a successful person who has... Yeah, or a, successful a fresh, and... A fresh of, perspective yeah, to also offer. Exotic yeah, yeah. Or, or, yeah. or interesting or how you call yeah. it. And in this category, chess grandmasters are oh. fit quite well. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so it's... it's it, I, I have never, like... I've never uh, met a situation where uh, uh, some, you know, HR guy would tell me like, you are a chess player, that sounds bad. I mean, uh -huh. they mostly say, ah, oh, a chess player, that's fantastic. Like, ah. that's interesting for us. So the reputation of chess, chess has a good reputation, according to that, you know, that? Yeah, um, that's, my, that's my impression, yes. Oh. Oh, okay. And coming, you, you said you, you wrote some books, non-chess books. Yes. What, what about? Uh, well, uh, I wrote a book about critical thinking, critical disinformation, hoaxes, how to fight them, uh, how to you know, uh, distinguish b the quality of the sources on the internet and so on, all this stuff. So, and so this is, despite your, you know, beside, despite having studied studied and being an academic this is this was an accessible book so for you know yes practical yes, yes. in a way yeah. well uh, well it was published by uh, a major slovak uh, newspapers mm -hmm. uh, so uh, and we sold i don't know 20000 copies or so so yeah. it's quite a lot uh, for well, Slovakia is a small market, okay yeah, there might not sure. be a lot in germany but we have like 5 million I think people 20000 would be a reasonably good number for yeah yeah for but okay well many. well Slovakia has five million inhabitants yeah. so you have to multiply that mm. uh, um, yeah and then I wrote something on ethical dilemmas mm -hmm. because in Slovakia and in the region 
there is a lot of tension about you know abortion about bioethics like eutanasia about mm -hmm. all these like difficult difficult stuff um lgbt rights and mm -hmm. all of that and yeah i just felt that a little bit of um calm approach of a chess grandmaster could help the so, rational approach rational yeah well that was a quite <laughs> a rational book because yeah. uh because yeah uh, the, the, in those topics uh, there might be a bit too much passion yeah, yeah. unlike in chess yeah. <laughs> and then i wrote a book on phenomenology and yeah. and uh, yeah um, how the everyday uh, experiences of human life interfere with science mm -hmm. and for example yeah i, I might give an example uh, the uh, vaccination yeah. yeah people fear that why do they fear fear, fear that yeah there yeah. are some s deep psychological things that yeah interfere with that uh, all the science says that it's a good thing right yeah yeah most yeah. most of the scientists yeah. say that and how how did you come to write this book so how did you how did that happen right yeah how did that happen or you know that you felt that your interest was so strong that you decided to write books about these topics well because as you, you also wrote chess books you know but then how how did how did you turn into an author about these things about yeah, these I was, topics? i was partly i was lucky of course yeah uh, as everyone would say perhaps when when uh, um, you succeed to do an interesting things sometimes it's just you meet mm. some person or so uh, I was asked by, the, by this newspaper to create um, a small brochure, yeah. maybe 500, uh, uh, 50 pages on critical thinking for mm -hmm. uh, high school students. Mm -hmm. So we have done that with a friend. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and that went to, I don't know, 25,000 students around in, in uh, the high schools in, in Slovakia. In Slovakia, it worked like that, that um, the... Um, the readers of the newspaper uh, were collecting money mm -hmm. for the brochure to come to the students, basically. Mm -hmm. And some companies uh, paid for that as well and so on. So the, the students didn't pay. So it was sponsored. It was sponsored but yeah. by the public, more, mostly. Yeah. Uh, some companies as well and so And because that one was successful, so then they, then they asked us to write uh, the, this, this bigger volume mm -hmm. for the public. But my friend decided to build a house instead which mm -hmm. is like fair enough. I mean, fair enough. So I did it. I did that More alone. Practical. I did yeah. that alone, and yeah, it uh, worked well. Uh, it was uh, hugely read and uh, um, acclaimed. So they asked me to do some other stuff. And the good thing was that I was I had a completely free hand when it comes to the topic. So I just picked what I liked and mm -hmm. and and then wrote a book. Yeah. And you so you enjoy writing. I enjoy writing much more than chess. More than chess. <laughs> Am I allowed to say that? <laughs> well, I mean, you can always edit the interview. And then, yeah. You enjoy writing more than, than chess. Sure, sure, yeah, sure. Okay. definitely, yeah. But still, in 2008, I think, you published uh, your first chess book, Beat the, Beat the Kid, uh, The King's Indian Defense. Yeah. Yeah. How, how did you decide or how did this book come about? Yeah, beat the kid. That was quite an unfortunate title. I wouldn't agree to that. <laughs> yeah, I was. I was today, wondering. I read this and I thought, well, you know, <laughs> maybe it's 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 a pun that's intended, but then maybe it's an unfortunate pun. Yeah, yeah, mm. I, I, I totally agree. But okay, uh, that uh, that's history now. It just yeah. it happened. Uh, well, I was at uh, Erasmus in um, in oh. Scotland. Yeah. And there I, uh, I met uh, Jakob Agard, who is himself a splendid chess author. Mm -hmm. and, and he, he is, I mean, he's the, he's the, the publisher of Quality, quality, quality exactly, Chess. Exactly, yeah. Quality Chess. So quality chess, they yeah. asked me to write a book uh, on uh, an opening, and that's how it happened. Yeah. Okay. And 10 years later, you published, or you wrote and published Under the Surface. And this book was, um, I think it was the book of the year 2018. Of the uh, English by, Chess Federation. Of the English mm -hmm. Chess Federation. And I love this book very much, I think. I think it's just 
I think it's very poetical and I was so surprised that you managed to to combine well a new perspective on chess training with these lyrical aspects and also these comparisons about you know uh, with everyday life or not everyday life but you know just a different view on chess on aspects of chess and I was wondering how does that go together with you know 10 years before you write about the King's Indian defense an opening book and then you write about the middle game how did that book come about it's it's the passion again right? <laughs> it's the passion again <laughs> it's the passion follow you know it's not Churchill a farm always but yeah. quite often <laughs> if you want to do something really interesting you should follow your passion I mean mm -hmm. the book wa um, the book uh, was previously a series of articles for one Czech web page yeah? oh. so so the ideas uh, there that were included there uh, were born in a course of uh, several years as I was writing these articles and I just wrote them because I found that interesting I mean yeah, yeah I found some interesting phenomenon I just wanted to 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 to, to share my uh, amazement with with uh, the yeah. readers of the of the uh, web page and then uh, I, I I have put that together I've sent it to Mr. Vtachnik and he said it's he said <laughs> it's rubbish. I shouldn't publish that. That was he a, said it's rubbish. Yeah, yeah. He said that okay, that they, that they are not like well, he criticized that heavily, but I uh, was able to to hold my spirits up and uh, try to publish <laughs> it. And I was refused by several publishers in in Czech Republic mm -hmm. uh, because it uh, it it uh, was published uh, in uh, in Czech Republic as well. Mm -hmm. And I found uh, 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 Miss uh, um, uh, Richterova, which is uh, uh, herself a, a grandmaster, who has put her money into that. Mm -hmm. So she has published it, and they sold like based amount of copies again. So it was like successful. Passion uh, paid uh, off. Well, I mean, uh, <coughs> sure. I mean, the difference between be, be the kid is that that was like. Uh, wrote to an order. Yeah. yeah. So I was I did it because I I, I got a job and I, I had to fulfill it, yeah. right? But this was just this is my child. I mean, yeah. so and the difference is I think felt because I enjoyed uh, wastely writing it. Yeah. And uh, and it seems that readers enjoy reading it. Yeah. And but how did you come come up with these concepts like Karpov's billiard balls and, you know, like, what was this again, this famous, where Arna, where Arna this example, where Arnold played two moves and... Um, immovable movers. Immovable, immovable movers. Yeah, I thought this was so impressive, you know, and <laughs> like, yeah, but, but maybe can you, maybe you can better explain yeah, well, what is immovable movers are. Well, immovable movers are, uh, you have positions where you make a few moves and then you return to the initial position. But you're up, so you're, you don't yeah. improve your own position, yeah. but you somehow uh, corrupt the position of your opponent. Yeah. So you get to the best uh, to, to the to the same position, but your uh, opponent's position is worse. Yeah. And that happens sometimes, and it's well. First of all, it's a lovely, uh, uh, amazing uh, part of chess, and secondly, you can show that it's not that you should all improve your own army or your own position, but you have to change the difference between the armies. That's what's important. Yeah. So, so, so that's how it happened. Well, uh, how did I find these concepts? Um, I think that my impractical studies, <laughs> let's come back to that. Yes, the Zen, uh, of, Zen of, master plays a role in that book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. well, yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, the, um, the fact that... I was devoting so much time to very basic ideas uh, in philosophy and so on. So I had this, um, and I still have this uh, approach that I'm asking myself very basic ideas about chess as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, so basic that other people maybe don't dare to ask them. Yeah. Yeah, for example, what are the the basic qualities of a piece? Yeah, yeah. I, I was so I was pretty ashamed when I read your, <laughs> when I read in the book that the rook. No matter on which square it stands, it always covers fourteen squares. And you should, like, we sh all should know that from the and elementary thought, school. I mean, yeah, yeah, of course. And I thought, well, I'm playing chess for 
more than 40 years and this seems to be a very basic concept which I'm now reading for the first time. Yeah, well, for example, I was uh, surprised when I was writing it that the rooks, um, well, everyone knows about the seventh rank and the eighth rank, that the yeah. rooks are very strong there, but there exists the rank, like, switched 90%, yeah? The H file and the G file yeah. are also much more effective than the central files. Yes. Because, because the <laughs> other pieces are suffering from the lack of centralization when defending against these rooks. Yeah. But the rooks, they, are, <laughs> they don't care. I mean, they are always the same. They are always yeah. happy. Yeah. 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 It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I also, I mean, I have to admit, I, well, in the course of writing, I, somehow, I sometimes also like, came with a concept or understood something yeah. what I didn't know. But you also illustrate what I you also illustrate these these concepts with new examples and a lot of examples. And I was wondering, how do you find these? You know, fragments from games, whole games. You know, just honestly, I don't be, I don't remember. Uh, it was, it's like five years now. I surely like my memory is a is a huge piece of trash bin you know so <laughs> there are like oh, plenty of old games hidden somewhere so i sometimes i just remind myself of some or remember some example but for example now we are speaking in hamburg because i have uh, yeah. f just f <clears throat> finished the recording of uh, fritz trainer where i'm yeah. speaking about specific pieces yeah. And for that, I'm um, just, you know, I feel like a fisherman. Um, uh, the, you know, the mega database is an ocean. Yeah. And you are trying to get the, 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 the right fish by, for example, prompting the search filter by some kind of word or position uh, of, uh, of so a piece. So you do not have a database like Dvoretsky, which you, acu which you have accumulated no. over a century, over decades, and then... Well, I'm, I'm not that old <laughs> to, <laughs> no. to have a 50-year-old. You know, <laughs> Maybe you inherited it. Someone gave it to you. And you no, 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 no. I would, I would also feel ashamed to use you know, someone else's example. So yeah. that's another thing. No, I, I, I'm a pretty chaotic person when it comes to you know <laughs> making order in your own things. So I don't have such a such a such a database, but I think I'm quite effective in in you know um, torturing the me the mega base so that it gives me the correct examples. I mean, the, uh, personally, I think this is so fantastic about the mega base that you have you know these search functions you can say. How many games are there with a knight on h8 or a knight on a8 you know and which world champion like this structure and so on and so on and this is you record your third chess based course now yeah fifth your fifth i mean isn't this because la the last year we recorded two ah this was power of the queen and the queen and the potential uh, of the rook yes i've yeah. done three yeah. Uh, during the last days. Yeah. So we have all the pieces, including the king, the bishop, ah, the knight. So okay. it will be complete now. I hope that all the pieces. Once it is produced, then we have all the pieces. We yeah. have excluded the pawns because they are not the pieces. <laughs> or a piece, <laughs> obviously. Not pieces, so. Yeah. And uh, how? Again, I have to. I repeat myself. But why this topic? You know, talking about the pieces and the characteristics. This seems to be somewhat unusual, you know, in, 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 in middle game training. Yeah, I know, but unusual is good. Unusual is good. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. Because, you know, uh, uh, most uh, people, or um, most coaches, they produce uh, opening videos. Yeah. They're easy to produce, they're easy to consum consume, and you get some false feeling of. Uh, of of uh, safety that I'm playing this this uh, opening, I got some uh, knowledge, I got some you know you know strategical ideas, but mostly like, theoretical knowledge. So I will be good in this opening, and then your opponent plays something else, and there is fear and trembling. Right? Yeah, what should I do? What I prefer is to have the ability to actually play chess. And then in wh wh whichever position you get yourself, you are able to analyze it to find uh, you know, elements in it and find your way. Yeah. So does this mean, or would you argue that studying the opening is, is uh, overvalued? Sure, it's important, but it's definitely mm -hmm. overvalued because the, the, the opening theory is fluid and uh, 
and the, it branches like endlessly. So as, um, as uh, my friend David Navara said, uh, if you want to study something else, once you have your repertoire finished on a good level, you will never get there. Yeah. Uh, even like super GMs will never have the, <laughs> the repertoire finished on a good level. So just for, let's forget about that. Let's do the other things as well. But doesn't it help you a lot? I mean, in, in a practical game, if you have a repertoire and you are able to play the first five, six, seven, ten moves rapidly, and you, you get a position you're familiar with, and I mean, just like you start well into the game and you know, you are not, you're not caught into a trap and well, you get a familiar isn't, position. Isn't it better to be familiar with the pieces, for example, with the chess game, like general, I mean, yeah, it, it seems, um, I mean, well, you asked, like initially you asked, why did I choose this topic? Yeah. Because I think that this, again, it seems to be <laughs> unpractical to have a you know look at 20 hours of videos on various chess pieces. Yeah, exactly. But yeah. it pays off later because if you don't do these impractical things once mm. in your life, <laughs> you will never get there. I mean. Yeah. And when it comes to like purely opening and uh, uh, opening knowledge, I have pupils that are I don't know, they have 2000 rating. Yeah. They have better opening knowledge than myself. Yeah. Because they just love it. Yeah. But I can play h6, a6 as black in the first two moves and I would beat them anyway. Like Carson does, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. That's, that's, that's the problem that, like, uh, you would laugh at my opening knowledge. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, because my, op uh, my, my opening knowledge is <laughs> very, very sketchy. But you know, I was that's, that's why I ask, because I have experienced so often, I, I just, I've never managed to get a repertoire and, you know, I feel... For move one, I feel I'm but, at a loss. But look, I, I was playing uh, the Sveshnik of Sicilian for 15 years. Yes. Because I was just... Very theoretical opening. Yeah, but just one opening because I was so lazy to learn anything else. I mean, <laughs> I just... <laughs> I did, did you never suffer any catastrophes or wound up in a position which was theoretically well, lost? I had, to, I had my sideways. Yeah. I lost a few games, of course. But like to over -pre prepare myself, me... Like in a very convincing way, that had to be Shirov or Vashir Lagrav or these mm -hmm. guys. Like normally, it, it, it's almost never happened to me that some iron just came and you know tried to to win a theoretical line against me. I only had sidestep somewhere, you know, mm -hmm. and then I understood the position at least as well as him. And yeah, what no. about the practical aspects that well, you save a lot of time on the clock if you know your variations well. But okay, that, is that what we want to do in chess? To like, uh, you know, uh, uh, learn all these long lines and that, then just reproduce them? <laughs> no, that's not what we want, but uh, we want to win. I mean, at least, at least it's what I want, you know, I want to win. And, uh, and uh, studying the opening is just one way of, you know, scoring more points. Well, in, well that's the, what I feel, you the, know. The thing is that when you want to win in chess, you need to do. Uh, to be good at doing the difficult things, yeah? yeah. You can study an opening, but yeah. so can your opponent, yeah? Yeah. But then you have, a, for example, a non-standard position strategical, yeah. and there you have to calculate well. That's already more difficult than, than, than uh, you know, uh, memorizing a line. There, part of people just, you know, give up and they don't calculate well. Mm -hmm. And then you have like understanding like strategical concepts and seeing the differences between a standard position, a bit non-standard position, yeah. seeing all these small flavors and very few people are able to do that. Yes. And there's where the GMs win. Uh -huh. Yeah. So for example, like uh, there are some GMs that are, that are willing to go with you into the Dragon Sicilian and just win there, yeah? yeah. With an amateur. Yeah. But normally, uh, like 90% of sensible GMs would just play knight free g3, bishop g2, like whatever happens, and overplay the guy yeah. later on when yeah. they are both on their own. So I don't, like, so, yeah, do, maybe, maybe a good piece of advice is like, do what the grandmasters do, yeah, when they play weaker players. Do they really go for theoretical lines to win? No. Uh huh. So play e4, a6 like Carlsen, <laughs> and well, then convert maybe not, and maybe go not to e, a French, yeah. Maybe not e4, a6, but they just, you know, create some kind of a structure 
they know that they understand the structure yeah. better than the opponent. And just by pure understanding, they win. Yeah. That ha happens so many times. Yeah. Well, this reminds me of the discussion about Chess 960, because when Chess 960 became more and more popular, I mean, it's not, it's not that popular anyways, but there was this idea that amateurs often argue that if I had the opening repertoire of a grandmaster, I would be able to, you know, have a, what, 100, 150 rating points more. And then Chess 960 came and, well, the top GM, GMs... Are still top. <laughs> still top. So it can't be the opening, you know? No, it's not the opening. It's not the opening. But I have... Um, uh, well, we have the chessboard here, yeah? Yes. So uh, I would... Uh, I, I have created a new version of chess. Uh, may I just shortly? Of course, yeah, of because course. That's, maybe the camera doesn't catch it, but <laughs> yeah, maybe okay, you, but I will you just go along explaining it. Yeah, well, because I also hate chess theory. Well, uh, well, not hate, but I'm not, I don't have a liking of yeah. that yet. Yeah. So I was thinking like how to get a unique position every time, but with chess nine sixty, the problem is that you get you know knights on strange positions, and and yeah. you know it do doesn't feel like chess. Doesn't feel so like chess. So I would yeah. like to have like the least um, difference uh, from the normal chess, but without the chess theory. Yeah. So here's the Marcos chess. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, is this uh, the first the time you show this? Yeah, it is. Um, so it it's is, a it premiere, is. it's a, it it's is. a debut. Mean, uh, well, I wrote an, one article about it in, in Czech Republic, but no one uh, cared. So yeah. I don't know whether someone will care now, but okay, it's an interesting thing. So the rules go as follows, that one uh, player yeah. plays two moves for white, and for black, yeah. For example, e three d six, yeah. Or, e, yeah, or, okay. Or, or e three b six, let's say. Yeah. Yeah. And the second player chooses the side, and then they play on. Oh. Yeah. The idea is that. Uh, so the, so if I open with e, I think I'm tricky. I open with e four and a five, and then. The then your opponent says, takes thank wide. Thank you very much. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So the, the so the rule goes. Uh, so, so the one one player decides a bit about the character of the of the position, oh, yeah. but he has to do it smartly to equalize as much as possible, oh. so that he doesn't give an edge to the opponent. Oh, this reminds me, I think, the most uh, the most just way of sharing, you know, yeah, like say exactly. a piece of check chocolate, you know. I mean, you are the one to cut the chocolate. I'm the one to choose, you know. Exactly. And so, of course. You usually will say you try to find it. You try to 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 split the chocolate in the middle. Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. so you had e you get equal positions and yeah. you get different positions. I oh. I think it might be quite interesting. That's an interesting idea. Yeah, I've never heard of it. Yeah, of course not because <laughs> <laughs> the debut. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, just to to finish, let me uh, touch the topic of computers. You know, mm -hmm. I. I would think that you're not that fond of computers from what you talk about training, but computers have revolutionized chess and they also have changed training immensely. Mm. And what's your approach to using computers and training? Uh, where do they harm? Where do they help? Well, um, I think that that computer engines have uh, changed the chess game f to the worse, uh, like the generally. Worse. Mm, yeah. I think so, yeah, because there is like less uh, place for independent thinking, for creativity, and <coughs> so on. Um, but I'm, I'm speaking specifically about chess engines, not like, for example, databases. I mean, that's that's a different story. Yeah. Uh, so it's a bit, you know, humiliating that even the best players in the world, when they're preparing for a game, they are sitting with a program you can send by email mm -hmm. and just asking <coughs> the program, like, what should I do? Like, isn't, that's a very strange, like, imagine a, 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 a composer uh, composing a piece and asking uh, uh, his or her fridge, like, how should I compose this one? I mean, it's a bit <laughs> humiliating, really. Uh, but okay, the computers are here, they will not go away, so, so let's, let's have a look at the practical approach. Um, first of all, an ambitious player shouldn't like, give up on working independently without computers. Yeah? So for example, analyzing your own games. Without you, computers? You should first analyze it without computer. 
then you should speak with your coach about it without a computer. And then you might have a look at, at how, how the computer... Uh, how, many, how many chess players do that? All my pupils. <laughs> oh, yeah, you yeah. But I, I, they have a, they, they have a really a strict... They have a strict... Uh, um, they are forbidden to use computers. But right? apart from your students or your, and your pupils, because even thinking about this, this seems to be, in a way, futile, you know? A waste of time. Like, oh, it is not. Yeah. You want to learn from the, from the game? Yeah. When you analyze it mm -hmm. uh, yourself, you learn the first time. Yeah. When the coach corrects you, lear you learn the second time. Yeah. And when you g the computer corrects you both, you learn the third time. Yeah. Yeah. When mm -hmm. you, when you uh, and finish a game, you open the laptop and you just put it in and see the evaluation. You learn only once. You, you, the truth. And, <laughs> and, and then you lose the interest in the game. Yeah. And you will never come back <clears throat> analyzing it. So... So it's not futile. On the contrary, it's the only way how to how to how to get the maximum from your own games. So I would really, really recommend this, because when you click through the game, uh, as I said, you don't need to know that on move twenty six the best move was knight c b five. Mm -hmm. You need to know that uh, in the middle game you underestimated the dynamic potential of your opponent, yeah. or that you have problems with opposite colored castlings, or these generalized pieces of, mm -hmm. of, of knowledge. Not that, because when you know that in move 26, the best move is knight cb5, <coughs> you can use this knowledge only in this exact position. Yes. Yeah, so that's a huge difference. Yeah. So definitely we should work without computers. And we should also work against computers. Uh, very strong players have a huge ability to discern which positions seem to be okay according to computers, but the opponent will suffer in them because it's, they are very difficult to be played mm -hmm. independently. Mm -hmm. So, for example, Magnus Carlsen is perfect in this. He is able to find uh, lines in openings where he knows that the objective evaluation will lure the opponents into playing them because, because they'll just feel equal, or... must be okay because it's equal. And then Carlsen would play a, s a substandard moves, move according to the computer, but you don't have a computer when you play the position, you know. You no. are there on your own, you Hopefully. know that you, sh that, you must, <laughs> that you should be like equal, but you don't, under you don't feel well in the position and yeah. that's, that's a very important thing. Yeah. But on the other hand, uh, computers, I mean, to my feeling, that chess is, that modern chess is as dynamic and as exciting and full of attacks and counter attacks, computer play, because of the computer. So people adapt to this, you know. Sure, they do, yes. And with Alpha Zero, I think this is the most obvious example that, you know, Alpha Zero played h4, h5, h6, and then suddenly people, you know, caught this trend and nowadays you see this is a routine maneuver and I mean when I was taught chess you you just you didn't touch your you didn't touch the outside pawns you know playing h4 in the opening or whatever just was you know suspicious you know your, your trainer or your coach would say no you never do this this is weakens the king and so what I want to say is that computers seem to have enriched the game enormously yeah and how does this go together with you know but the skepticism about computers and the, the, the playing strength computer added to, to the human players. But that is also disputable because did the computers enrich the game? They, in fact, they didn't, yeah? They just, uh, they just produced some raw material because yeah. computers don't think, yeah, do they? Computers don't think. So yeah. there were some people with chess knowledge and so on, they were actually able to discern the new ideas in this raw material. Yeah, that, that yeah. realizing that the yeah, pawn for, on h6... For example, yeah, so, very so, strong. so it was a human being who saw the real value in this, yeah, mm -hmm. not the computer. It's the same as if, you know, you can, uh, you can uh, artificially, with artificial in, in intelligence, you can create text or, you know, um, uh, some kind of uh, paintings and so on. But there has to come someone, a human being, and to say, okay, this is rubbish. Yeah. 
yeah. this is maybe worth something yeah. you know so so there is a there's a curating role mm -hmm. of humans that are actually able to incorporate what the the, the machines are producing yeah, yeah? So that's one thing. So it's not just solely computers. Maybe we don't see some patterns which are, which are there. Yeah. And some new guys from a new gen generation will analyze Alpha Zero again and find yeah. a completely new pattern. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's that's one one thing. The the other thing is that uh, this uh, new approach to chess is mostly important for the very best. Yes. Yeah? You need to find something new to fight the <laughs> The, the 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 strong uh, well prepared opponents that are like dedicating all the their time to the chess game and you want if you want to be better you need something extraordinary and you turn to alpha zero or whatever mm -hmm. but imagine as, as a club player yeah? yeah imagine capablanca playing i don't know third german league yeah yeah capablanca is dead for dozens of years right yeah. for decades and he yeah. would just kill everybody you think so? Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, I think so as well. But there's a huge okay. There, debate. there might be some draws, of course, because you know he would he wouldn't care about you know yeah. simplifying and so on. But I think that that like uh, people like Aliehin, Capablanca, Botvinnik, and so they are not an, that's not an amateur level. Yeah. Yeah. It's just they they would just kill all the amateurs. And they would find their I don't know their peak somewhere among. Um, GM professionals, like not the best ones, of course, but somewhere in, on the professional level. Yeah. So you don't really need to know what Alpha Zero says to mm -hmm. be a better club player. Yeah. You need to understand the game as the, the rules of the games that are known for 100 yeah. years. Yeah. Yeah. So you you would you would you would advocate or you would you think that uh, the players of the past even without, you know, additional theoretical knowledge would be able to hold their own and nowadays... But what does it mean? Chess? What does it mean hold their own? They would, ch they would beat the club players, I would, yeah. I'm sure about that. Well... Amateur players. Yeah. Well, I think they would even beat, you know, average GMs, I think. Yeah. yeah. I'm an average GM, so <laughs> I should, should take sight of an average GM, but uh, perhaps they would, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so so there there is something about chess knowledge, yeah. about the ancient chess knowledge that is still still like pretty much uh, applicable to 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 um, today uh, today's today. So like my approach to chess computers or yeah. my advice to a club player would yeah. be pick uh, chess structures, pick positions that you understand, and where the knowledge of the computer is not that high. Mm -hmm. yeah, so don't pick ultra sharp Neidorf. Even if you'd enjoy tactical play? Well, uh, if you enjoy tactical play, you can play uh, various very strange um, pirts and other uh, stuff that your opponent wouldn't expect. Yeah. And <coughs> still, you would be probably quite... Uh, quite um, um, quite successful with that, and so, so please just pick up some some uh, opening you like, where positions where the computer just you know doesn't kill you because it's not so ultra tactical and ultra yeah. well known, and then and then just play as if without a computer. Okay. And then you would play yeah. like against the instincts of majority of your opponents who are just, you know, clicking on the computer yeah. and numbing themselves. <laughs> and yeah, you would be the left-hander in the chess, chess course. You will get an yeah. edge of, of playing normally. Yeah. Okay, to finish one last question, and we touched on this topic before, but what do you think is the most important when training or teaching, or to quote the title of your third chess book, what is the secret ingredient for successful training and successful play? Well, that's a very broad question yes. because it depends on, on the personality mm -hmm. of the, of the, of the uh, player. But I, if I imagine that most of the people who are looking uh, or watching this video yeah. are uh, people who love chess, yeah. they have their own professional career somewhere else, 
and uh, they would like to improve somehow, but they have like limited resources when it comes to time and energy. Yeah. I would say try to focus on the practical aspects of the game, which means uh, because mostly uh, uh, club players are over over evaluating the value of, of theoretical knowledge. Mm -hmm. I mean, reading books, uh, looking at the at the uh, openings and so on. But you need to know how to decide at the board effectively. You need to know how to work, uh, how to use your time, how not to dream, daydream, and then find yourself after 20 moves in some kind of uh, deep time travel. You need to know how to prepare against the exact opponent so that you get the positions that you... Uh, you need to know how to deal with, uh, with shocks. You mm -hmm. need to know how to calculate effectively. That's, that's a huge, that's a huge hole for most of the club players. They just, they, they have such weak calculation that they're just throwing, you know, points into that hole. And yeah, <clears throat> how to discern which moment is decisive actually and which is not. Yeah, the so, crucial moments. So practical, uh, the, the, the practical act of playing, so I have some knowledge, I know something about chess and how to sell it at the board. Mm -hmm. That's an important thing. If you are interested in that, uh, you can purchase the secret ingredient which we wrote with, together with David Navarra. Yeah. And uh, which, by the way, was the FIDE uh, uh, book of the year uh, 2021. Oh. So it got a major prize as well. So maybe it's Gelfand praised it, so you might like it as well. <laughs> <laughs> I liked it quite a lot. I also liked talking to you and thank you very much for your insights and for the interview. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.